and welcome to Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Fraser Jackson. Coming up on this evening's show. Nigerians head to the polls this weekend to vote on a new president, but with an upsurge in youth voters fed up with the status quo, the race appears to be wide open. We'll speak to a spokesperson of one of the people hoping to get the country's top job. Cyclone Freddy slams into the eastern coast of Madagascar. Schools and transport have been suspended as high winds and heavy rains lash the island. And we'll tell you about the bus in Liberia that is connecting rural areas to the internet and teaching people how to use computers. Well, this weekend, voters in Africa's largest economy will go to the polls. With current President Buhari unable to stand due to term limits, the race is on to replace him. The ruling APC party is fielding former Lagos Governor Bola Tinubu. The main opposition party, the PDP, has nominated former Vice President Atiku Abu Bakar, now in his sixth race for the presidency. But this normally two-horse race has been upset by the Labour Party's Peter Obi, who has used social media to gain a significant following amongst the urban youth. With the race seemingly too close to call, some have dubbed this the election of a generation. While well, whoever wins faces a colossal challenge. Mismanagement and poor policies have led to a slumping economy, rising inflation, unemployment and poverty levels, and also a worsening security situation. France 24 has spoken to two of the candidates in the race, and tonight we're speaking to the spokesperson for the main opposition candidate, Etiku Abu Bakar. Daniel Boala joins me now live from Lagos. Mr Boala, thank you so much for speaking to us here on France 24. It's good to have you with us. Thank you now, for having me, although I'm in Abuja. You're in Abuja. OK, thank you for that. Your candidate was vice president from 1999 until 2007. He's running on a platform of being the most experienced candidate in the race. How does he expect to get a handle on Nigeria's economic slump? Well, thank you for having me. What is coming into the race with his experience because he has had the opportunity of uh, serving as a vice president from 1999 to 2007. And in Nigeria, when they came on board in 1999, it was uh, a coming after the military. So they didn't have experience. He was the one that had the opportunity of headhunting talent. And they were able to drive the country out of the recession that were in at that time. They were able to uh, bring about what we call revolution in the telecom industry. And all through the period he served, he was able to serve successfully because the president at the time was going all over the world trying to get what we call debt cancellation. So he had that opportunity. But much more than that, his plans are clearly defined in his manifesto to the Nigerian people that he calls my covenant with the Nigerian people. And he addressed the issue of unity, security, education, infrastructure, and uh, this, this concept that I'm you know, presently confronting the Nigerian people. Security has become a huge problem in Nigeria, from an Islamist insurgency in the north to widespread and growing numbers of kidnappings that have taken place across the country. The last right. time your party, the PDP, was in office was with Goodluck Jonathan. He lost 2015's race to current President Buhari, arguably over insecurity in the country. What lessons has the PDP learned from, from that race? So uh, when the APC took over from us in 2015, they had the opportunity in the eight years to be able to reverse what they call the trend at the time. And uh, arguably, they were able to buy the highest number and volume of the uh, military hardware and assets to be able to fight the Boko Haram and other forms of uh, criminal element. But what we have seen over the last eight years in their ad uh, attempt to administer on the security in the country is the lack of intelligence gathering. And then you talk about the political will to call the military or paramilitary officers to account in case they go wrong. And then the issue of fundamental human rights, because when you execute that kind of a war, it's important that it is an intelligence-driven war so you can separate between the insurgent and normal people, or rather, you know, patriotic citizens. So what we've learned is that, one, we do not have enough ground troops on the ground. Number two, we, our soldiers are not motivated. Number three, there is this distrust between the ground troops and the leadership. When they look at the political class corrupting themselves, you know, plundering on this wealth of the country while they are in the field fighting the war, sometimes it affects their psychic and in the way in which they make their approach. So Atiku came out with a clearly defined plan that is going to restructure the country so we can have multi-layer policing across the all states of the Federation. That way we'll be able to deal with local issues 
And everything does not have to depend on the military. He also believed that by the time we increase the capacity of the armies and some of the paramilitary to probably one million, we will be able to look at that frontally and deal with it. Corruption goes deeper than that, though, doesn't it? Your candidates and the other main candidates have both been accused of corruption, uh, allegations they both deny. And for full disclosure, Peter Obi has also been linked to shady business dealings in the past. What does your candidate, Abu Bakr, what is he going to do to crack down on corruption? He, so, for example, uh, what is accounting to, for corruption in Nigeria? The institutions are not strengthened. So it is very easy for somebody running an institution or engaging with the institution from a transactional point of view to uh, you know, game the system. And we have identified that as fundamentally. Strengthening the institution is one key element in doing that. But this, the second thing is you have to introduce accountability. And that has to be from the bottom up. It doesn't have to be like, OK, it has to be from the top to the bottom and not bottom up, because leadership is by example. Above everything else, we have to give the fight to the Nigerian peoples. When you get the citizens to own the fight, against corruption, you are able to get intelligence that are very critical in the fight against corruption. And above all, we will make sure that the economy is boosted to a point where people will not have to depend on corrupt practices to survive. Because when you hear what the Americans call the American dream is the opportunities created for the citizen to thrive. That is what we are seeking to do when we're able to unite Nigerian people. I think it's fair to say the youth, the youth in your country are, are fed up with the status quo that's happened so far. We've seen a massive boost in young voters signing up for this election. 10 million voters, 77% of those are under the age of 34. How, how likely are they to sway this election, do you think, given the rise of someone like Peter Obi, who has got such incredible support amongst the youth? So that's the point. The point is that the Nigerian press or the media have mismanaged information regarding the voter search and the willingness of the youth to participate in governance. So, for example, the Nigerian is divided along two zones. You know, you have the northern along two regions, the north and the south. The south relatively are exposed more to education. So you'll find more of the youth from the southern Nigeria on social media platforms and engaging very robustly. Now, in the north, that is not to suggest we don't have such, but a greater number of those ones are far below in terms of education and those opportunities. So the misconception that is peddled by mostly the media is that they make it seem as if the population of the South is the total reflection of the youth in the country. So if you look at traditional political parties like our party, PDP, or you can even go to APC, you discover that we have equal and more number of youth in those parties than the parties that are there with Peter Obi. And when you come to Nigeria, there is this growing um, uh, you know, objection to the fact that he is actually driving a movement of the young people. Many people believe that he is cashing in to a movement that had already started with the NSAS. But unfortunately, his philosophy, his ideology, and his way of doing things does not gel with the aspirations of the youth, the youth people. So that's the, 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 the problem is likely to encounter. OK, we'll see how that all comes out in the wash this weekend. Uh, Mr. Daniel Biwala, thank you so much for joining me there on France 24. A pleasure, as always. Moving on, Cyclone Freddy made landfall on Tuesday as it hit the eastern coast of Madagascar. School and transport were suspended in the affected area as people braced for heavy winds and heavy rains. The weather system has weakened as it made its way over the Indian Ocean, as Lauren Burstershire reports. The calm before the storm. Manakara residents were making final preparations as they braced for the imminent arrival of tropical cyclone Freddy. Some attempted to shore up their fragile homes with sandbags and trenches, while others sought refuge in churches and schools, hastily transformed into emergency shelters. We're scared of the wind, but it's mostly the rain that worries us. Our house is next to a bridge. It's very vulnerable to flooding. After battering Mauritius and the reunion on Monday, the Category 4 storm was headed straight towards the east coast of Madagascar. And while it largely spared the two neighboring islands where it didn't make landfall, Cyclone Freddy is expected to wreak havoc as it sweeps through the center of the country, bringing winds of over 200 kilometers an hour. The World Food Programme says over 2 million people could be affected on an island where extreme weather phenomena 
have become a yearly occurrence. We've been reaching out to local communities to warn them of the danger. From what we know, this is one of the most intense cyclones we've seen. We can't just ignore it. The Great Red Island regularly experiences tropical storms around this time of year. In February 2022, Cyclone Batsirai partially destroyed the coastal city of Mananjari, killing over 130 people and leaving millions of others without a home. And finally, in rural northern Liberia, a bus goes from school to school to teach students how to use computers. This mobile lab has already helped train over a thousand youngsters, providing a crucial service in a country where computer and internet access remains very limited. Take a look. The school day may be over, but the students aren't headed home just yet. Inside this yellow bus, a dozen laptops are available for them to learn computer and digital skills. This lab on wheels was created by Jeremiah Cooper and was inspired by his own struggles as a computer science student. I didn't even know how to power on computer, but I went on to choose to study information technology at a university level. And I was humiliated the first day that I got into the computer lab. My finger got frozen on the keyboard. I didn't know how to tap and uh, it was humiliating, you know, our experience. So ever since my dream has been to be able to extend computer literacy to uh, children graduating from high school. A dream that recently became reality. After receiving a UN grant in November, Jeremiah was able to launch a startup, the New Breed Tech Hub, in the northern Liberian city of Ganta. There, hundreds of youngsters have trained and developed digital skills, an opportunity usually afforded only to those living in the capital, Monrovia. Jeremiah also transformed and equipped this bus in order to expand his reach to rural communities. For each time we reach, we reach this new community, you know, the momentum is high. Students are eager, they want to learn. One of the world's least developed countries, Liberia, is also lagging behind when it comes to digital technologies. World Bank data shows only 26% of Liberians had access to the Internet in 2020, compared to 70% in South Africa. That's it for Eye in Africa. Stay tuned to France 24.